So welcome. Um, I'll call you Marilyn Coffey, activist. Marilyn Coffey, yes. I'm a cultural activist. I've been involved in community activism for a very long time. I'm from Dominica and I came to Manchester to study and, and remained here in Manchester and I got a job as a neighborhood youth and community worker, the first African Caribbean black woman in Cheatham Hill and I've lived and worked there since the 80s. At the moment, I am, um, let me start again. I actually worked at, for eight years as a youth and community neighborhood worker at Abram Moss. And I think that in itself was an achievement, being the, one of the only black women there in a nearly all white institution and trying to develop work with the black community, African and Caribbean, and particularly young people and young black women. So that was an achievement in itself until they disestablished my post and I had to rethink what I would be doing in the future. Yes. Currently, I am I've, I've, um, redisc I've rediscovered my, uh, my creative side. I'm actually doing quite a lot of poetry. I am doing art, artwork. And also at the moment, I'm currently involved in supporting Dominica and the hurricane. But prior to that, I was involved in the church, St. John's Church. And one of my major interests at that time was supporting people with mental ill health issues. And we had a development through the church with a, a cafe and developing there. And I was also in, have been involved with the African Caribbean Mental Health Organization I was a service user rep for three years and we did lots of awareness raising with the institutions going around the country promoting the African Caribbean Mental Health um, Organization as well as raising awareness about the issues and how it affects us as women and particularly at that time there was lots of stigma about Afri African Caribbean male and how they, how they come into the system. Mm -hmm. So there was a great deal of activism and campaigning and challenging at that time and even using my poetry to promote and to, to raise awareness of that. We traveled to Birmingham, to Bournemouth, to Kendall, lots of places <laughs> that in, in England that I've never been before. So that was, have been some of my my developments, yeah. When I came into um, youth and community, were protect, particularly at Abraham Moss, although there had been activities in relation to young people and young black people, there wasn't any there wasn't any input really in relation to their culture and the struggles that have been happening. So, and they re they really embraced that. And the way one of the, there were two major um, starting points for me was to get the young women at that time, there was quite a lot of stigma about women and children. So in order to break that stigma was to get them to come together. And we actually set up a, a group called Taliba, Women with Children, and it was Seeker After Knowledge. And th within that group, we, we traveled, we had meetings, we, they, did fo they learned photography, they learned to do through another link called Kabusha, like a business link, business cooperative. We actually did um, t-shirts and that was one of the ones that we did for, North Bank, for uh, the Sickle Cell Center. We did one for Abbasindi, we took them to see Abbasindi project. And one of the major achievements at that time with the young women was to do the Size 8 magazine. And many of the articles in the magazine 
is to do with where they were coming from. For example, a young mother speaks. Some of them talked about the difficulties that they were experiencing in school and the, the teachers, particularly in maths, what the teachers were doing. We went, we came down to Abbasindi, we interviewed Abbas, Abbasindi women and a whole range of different things. So that was really um, a really yeah. exciting time for, 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 for the women. And we actually went, for the first time, the, a group of us left Manchester and went to Wales. And coming from the Caribbean, I just assumed that people would like, they would like water and, um, and with the, you know, and everything else. And some of them were quite scared and some of them with their children, when they were so young, um, was afraid of water. And I remember holding one of the, he was about four or five, holding him. And he said, oh, I can't do it. And I was saying, come on. So I had to take him and make him step one, two, three across the, across the river. And there was, we did um, horse riding. And that was very interesting. And learn how to cook in a different way. We did basket making and knitting up until late hours of the night. So it was quite an interesting time for you know for for us that and i really enjoyed working working with the young young women and the and the young men uh, as well i mean another another um aspect of it was um as part of my work i had to do lots of outreach work because although the college was claiming that it met the needs of the local community there was hardly any um, activities in the neighborhood for the African Caribbean peoples. So one of the um, links I made was with the Seventh-day Adventist Church at that time. And it was just such a, a, a really interesting development because we actually did the, the first gospel festival in North Manchester and it was on three days at the Abraham Moss Center at, at that time. And it was very, very well attended. And um, I did, uh, st you know, use, use my poetry <laughs> to actually introduce the, the work. And basically it was saying, I check it out here, check out there. I asked pastors everywhere. They point to the schools and colleges, the big institutions of knowledge, but there weren't any black people in any of these places, you know? So yeah, so these are um, some of the things. And, and developing from that, at that time, there was a great deal of um, immigration and anti-deportation issues taking place. And so, I remember someone from Women's Aid actually coming to me, although that wasn't part of my work. She was concerned that there was a lady who is under threat of deportation. And at that time, Women's Aid wasn't, um, hadn't, didn't have any links with the, the community in North Manchester, nor were they familiar with some of the issues in relation to, in relation to anti-deportation campaigns and immigration issues. So we actually had a major link and we were able to support um, uh, that, that, that um, lady. And I think I could actually say her name was Manda Kunda. And through that, we, we developed um, a big conference with so many of the Manchester anti-deportation campaign people. There was, um, so you, you basically joined with obviously we, 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 yes, in we South did. Manchester yeah, in South Manchester areas. and other areas mm -hmm. and um, had a, a, a major, major conference. And also we did. Um, yeah, it just shows that picture because that shows obviously some of the yeah. campaign that went on. Yeah, the, 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 the matches and campaign. But this was the main one that I was. Um, so, so, you know, so supporting the Mandakunda defense campaign. And uh, from, from that development um, with the, um, at that time, Steve Cohen 
and so many of us activists, we actually came together and did the development so that we could actually set up the immigration aid unit. And it is now still, it was on Cheatham Hill Road, but it has moved to Crumsell, but that is still going and offering support to people who are under threat of deportation. Obviously now things have changed, the immigration laws have changed. It's more to do with, you know, people with refugee and asylum seekers. But at that time it was like, oh my goodness, I don't know what the government was doing at that time, yeah. I will use the example of Manda Kunda. Um, some of the women, and her, she in particular, it was in relation to Im her immigration status and the link to her husband, who was a student at that time, and domestic violence. So there were three different angles. And that is why one of the reasons that she was actually in a refuge and very isolated, didn't have any support. And that is why one of the reasons why um, the women's aid worker at that time actually came and ask whether I'd be in a position to, you know, to support, to support her. Um, and so in terms of, yes, there was the immigration aspect, but, but it was important for also to look at the, the, her psychological needs and the issue of do domestic violence. And through, through that, um, I made links with uh, women in central Manchester who were youth and community workers and community activists at that time. And another development that came out from that was for, her, for us to come together as black women and we set up the, um, a, a refuge for black women because quite m many of the, the um, issues that came out with women that are under threat, their status are difficult because it, it, at that time it was linked to, to the, the status of, of, of the man. And so they, it was as if they didn't have any rights. Yes, yeah, so yes exactly. They were add -on yeah, exactly. They were, were add-on. So we had to really address a, a, great, a, a, great, a, great a great deal of that, yeah. In the 80s, I have to admit that there was a great deal of support from the MPs, from Manchester City Council. We even had an anti-deportation working group at the town hall and they, they offered monies for the different campaigns and we used to meet up once a month to discuss some of the issues and that is how the um, immigration that was a link into the developing the immigration aid unit so yes at that time there was a great deal of support for anti-deportation campaigns and one of uh, a major aspect that came out from all the struggles of all the different women and men who are under threat of deportation. And also, as you say, in your case of the mom, there were children, there were children involved. And we actually had a huge, huge uh, campaign called the Right to Be Here, a guide to immigration and the immigration laws. And that, and um, we developed that, that guide. And also there was a big conference that was held at Carmel Road and we also made links with um, the West Indian Sports and Social Club to, to raise awareness and to raise funds as well. And just to, and there was a great deal of support, a great deal of support, yeah. Manchester became like a hub where people would ring up or come in, call for information, and Manchester became a hug for advice and support. And there were women from Hull, there were women coming from London. There was a group of women called Wages for Women from Housework. They were actually involved. We had to get support, link, link support from the, the police, 
because that was an, an, another issue, uh, another issue as well. So yeah, so there were many women from all over coming um, for support and guidance. Manchester at that time was the was the hub. <laughs> really was. There have been changes, um, and I think it, it it is you know people are not marching anymore. People are campaigning in a, in a different way, maybe through. Um, through through social media so it's not as it's not as overt and out so that is something that has that has really made quite, you know quite quite a difference and i think from the campaigning and from meeting up uh, meeting up at people's homes in social in other social areas there was um, a, a sense of togetherness and people patting you on your back you know um you know you have a cup of tea together that was so that was so important you know but now it's out it's it's like maybe things are happening but i am unsure there was a way of working that brought everyone together and there was there were discussions and everyone's views were respected obviously there were differences but we knew that we were going down uh, you know a, a, a certain track and we knew who the the enemy was <laughs> so to speak but now it's it's very different and also i suppose because some of the um organizations are now established you know because before it was a movement and we didn't have a base and and so that is that has been uh, some some other areas of differences that I, I have noticed so when people have got a base they have to have their management committees and they have to be to have rules and regulations that in that movement you really didn't have so that is a major another major issue I remember at that time, in particularly in, in North Manchester, the, the MP that was linked to us was uh, Bob Litherlin, and he was very, very supportive. But some of the laws change in so far as they, at the, the MPs were given directions that they couldn't support certain immigration and deportation campaigns in certain way they, they were they were yeah well, there were restrictions put on and so that hindered uh, a great uh, uh, you know hindered pro progress mm -hmm. and um, yeah that hindered progress and also the the home office have had really um, different ideas and I remember there was another la lady um, I, I had supported and Bob Lee, with, uh, Whittington, the the Home Office um, man at that time, you know, the letter that he had sent uh, was really, really, really degrading. And we we actually challenged it, and we, I think he had a, a light bulb moment, and we got a letter. We didn't have to campaign. We had a, a letter to say, yeah, it was all right. But yes, yeah, some of the rules and regulations were very, very restricted, and that created quite a lot of anxiety for, for many people, for all of us really, yeah. Our fight was on so many, so many d d different, different levels because obviously with the children, um, it was their schooling. You know, we had to campaign about school and at that time there was a great deal of um, controversy in relation to the um, expulsion of school children and you know so it was like we had one thing happening on one side another thing happening and then we had to take on a, a, another fight yeah and um they didn't understand and basically it was always community activists people who were who needed wanted to see change always had to take up the banner in in different ways and that is one of the the links i actually made um, with um, ad, with uh, ex in, in relation to education and expulsion, because I myself was restricted insofar as what I'm able to do at that time as a youth and community worker, because I was linked to um, community education and the college, and my, some of my radical ways of working were were contrary to what the colleges were the college at that time was looking for 
And so I was very um, pleased I was able to come into Central Area and, you know, talk to certain people and try to see whether I can get, you know, support. And one of the links I actually had made that time was with um, Louise Dakakodia when she was she involved in sickle cell. And that was another issue that came out uh, out of the needs of um, our culture, sickle cell and the impact on us and with Werner Angus. And the young women I was working with actually were there when the sickle, center, sickle cell center was opened by the, 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 the West Indian cricket team. <laughs> And so that was the a link that I, I made with Louise Dakakodia at, at that time to actually try to raise the, the educational needs of, the, of young people and, and the children and what's happening and stuff like that, yeah. People were, were open and wanting to develop. Even some of the, the women who may not, you know, have, have had professional um, um, jobs, were knew that they could come to certain places and they felt safe and enabled to in order for them to discuss some of the issues or take up um, whatever um, matter they wanted you know to 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 play so yeah at, at that time there wasn't maybe things have changed now but at that time i just saw lots of people coming together and black women, as well as linking in with some of the things that the men were doing in the community at that time. And uh, yeah, and being very vibrant and provocative. And and I was told by one lecturer years when after I left well, that I have ceased to be an irritant. It seems to be an irritant now. Can you imagine? And that is, <laughs> yeah, so someone in the, no names mentioned. <laughs> In a, in a, in a, in a, um, the college, the polytechnic at that time. Uh, about five years ago, I was walking up in, in, um, in Didsbury, and there was uh, a, a, a man who approached me. I'm thinking, do I know you? And he actually recognized me, and I didn't know him from Adam. And he, he came and he actually said, I just wanted to tell you that um, you, my, my wife came to speak to you all these years ago and now she's a social worker and um, I just want to thank you. And I was just walking up in Didsbury. Yeah, and it's just uh, amazing, you know. And that, at that time I needed, I was going through some really tough time um, and I really needed to hear that. So I think because as, as we get older, we get, um, some of us have been really affected, both mentally and physically. Some people have had breakdowns, have, have experienced that, and you have to go through a recovery process. And in certain situations, spiritually, I think it's important for the young people to know that what the pioneers have done and and they themselves are thriving in different ways. So I think it would be really great if that could happen. Not men as, as you know, young, young, some of the young women, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely, definitely. And also for wider why people to know about that history because it, it's hidden. You know, it's like you told women of the soil. Yeah, the soil is down the ground. <laughs> And it's rich, it's so rich, but then it's on the ground. So we've got to raise it up somehow, make it a big mountain. 